And Father, as we are in a war, Lord, in a spiritual war with the, with the powers of darkness, so in the Middle East are the Israelites. Only they're in a physical war and a spiritual war. They have all sorts of things going on at there at the moment. And we don't know, Lord, the world is just sitting at the moment, watching and holding their breath right around this planet with seven million people, one little nation and another nation of people are at odds, but it's drawing in every country from the biggest superpowers to the smallest. Everybody is watching. Father, we pray for the Israelites. We pray for the Jews. We pray for the Palestinians. We pray that they will have a change of heart. We lift those nations up to you, Lord God. Russia, Ukraine, Lord, where there's just so much conflict. Father, we pray, Lord God, and we lift up all of those regions to you. We lift them up, Lord God, to you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you will have your way, that peace may come. If peace doesn't come, Lord God, then we know that we're in for a really, really exciting time. And I say this, Lord, in the light of the fact that if we read your word, we are in the end times. And I'm excited that we are in the end times, but we know who our God and Saviour is. So, Father, this morning, all those countries that I've met mentioned this morning, Lord, we lift our hands to you and we pray for them and we ask, Lord God, for your mercy, your grace, your love, and you peace beyond those and We must remember them in prayer also. We are just so privileged, church, to be in this place of New Zealand, the uttermost parts of the earth, of the earth past Samaria and past Judah to the uttermost. That's us, the uttermost parts of the earth. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. I'd just like to um, say while, just before I mention this, we get into the word, um, there's an Easter show put on, it's been put on by... Um, Always Kingdom Church, which is down at, have we got the address? If no, if you're not doing anything, um, Easter, we have our Sunday Easter service as normal. But if you're not doing anything, they're having they're having Friday the 29th, 5 p.m. service, Saturday. 30th 5 p.m. service and Sunday 5 p.m. service and all services will be followed with a supper after. So there's a few of the pastors around town that have agreed to be involved and show some support to the to the people in Kaitaia. Amen. As, as churches and as leaders we need to do that and so far I've got around about eight pastors that are really keen to get together and pray. Keen to get together and Focus on, on our region. Focus on Kaitaia. And I don't know how, but I, I'm the new person on the block here, but I ended up, I seem to be heading it up, and I've asked all of them that they've got, every one of them I've said, look, you guys have been around here longer than I have. I'm just the new boy on the block. And they all go, well, it's your idea. <laughs> and I said, but didn't you used to have all of this going before? And they'd go, yeah. But, Sorry. Oh, behind the RSA, um, Dunn Street. It's, it's, it's going to be called Lift Them Up. So the pastors have, um, by and large, in, agreed. And I heard that there was about 15 or 16 different churches. I haven't got around to them all. It's actually quite hard to get a hold of the pastors, believe it or not. But I have been busy trying to orchestrate that and... Um, work with people in church who have, we all have needs, amen? So it's been a rather busy time. I've had personal busy times in our family. So we're all busy people, but let's make this clear. We should never dis, 
or take away from our time with the Lord. Amen? Put him first and everything else will fall into place. Thank you, Lord. Um, so, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, I bless you this morning for your word. I bless you for your anointing on the church, Lord God, on your word. You hover over your word. And Father, as a minister of the gospel, I pray that your word would grip our hearts, would grip our minds, will change our life, rearrange the way that we think, challenge us and make us fresh, make us new. May we have our, your blessings that come from you, make it our blessings, and they are new every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, amen. I'll just start off with, um, which isn't going to be on the board, but I'll read it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And the title of my message this morning is called The Word of God Is, capital letters. The Word of God Is. And you might, may have heard me quote this a few times, you may not. The Word of God is supernatural in origin. In Genesis 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, and we're talking about origins here, in the beginning, God. If I was to say, let's stop it there, that just seems like a crazy statement because it doesn't flow in. In the beginning, God. But we've got to kind of section this off because we're human. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and I'm talking about the supernatural origin of the word. So it started before earth was around. It started before anything was around. Its origin or its genesis is at the beginning. Now you try and work out what is the beginning if there's no beginning. He just always was. He just always is. The word of God is supernatural in origin. The Word of God is what we call the Bible, the Word of God. And when we say the Word of God, we are actually invoking the origin and the power of the universe that God used to put into motion everything that we see and do in our life. Everything that was made, the chairs that you're sitting on, actually comes from the Lord because he put it all in motion. He spoke it and it happened. So in the beginning, God, the word is supernatural in its origin. And so when we look at John chapter 1, John chapter 1 just says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not made anything that was made. He was the life and the light of, of men. And when you start to read the scripture and you start to see the content and you understand the context and you start to pray, and you put those two things together. I was just sharing with a sister this morning. You know, if we pray too much, oh, sorry, we'll start, with, we'll start with reading the Word. If you read lots of the Word and you don't pray, you will dry up. I'm telling you, you will dry up. But if you read the Word and you read and you pray, when you pray, it will build you up. Yeah? So if you get... Lots of prayer over here and lots of reading. You see, if you, if you dry up with the word and you just go into prayer full time, I've seen this happen, you blow up. You lose sense of where everything is. You get so spiritually and heavenly minded, you have no earthly use. So if you read the word and you pray and put them together evenly, you grow up. If you pray lots, then read the word lots. 
Because when you pray, the anointing will come. You see, it's the origin. It's supernatural in origin. The moment you start to read the Word, you are connecting with the origin and the genesis of the power of who God is. And you can't go past that because it's before the beginning. So once we get it into our heads, well, let's pray, let's read, and we start to grow up, we start to realize that God, I know it's taken me years to figure this out, I started to realize that God has put all of these things in order so that we will grow up to be people that we should be. If you don't pray and if you don't read the Word, you are stunted. You remain like a person that's static. And you can visit as many churches as you want in your life. Nothing's going to change. The moment you start to connect up with the Word and you start praying, you are now plugging in to the original thing of the Word of God being supernatural in origin. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So how do we determine what is the beginning? Well, if we think of, think of it like this, Jesus was with God right at the beginning because the Word says so. In Genesis it says, and I know it sounds repetitive, but sometimes I've got to repeat it to myself a few times because I'm a thick skull. I am. You think I'm not. I am. It takes a little bit to get to me, but when I do, it's good. Praise the Lord, especially when the Lord's knocking on my head. So in the beginning, when we look at what the Word of God is, it is supernatural in origin. And what that does, the origin now gives you destination. It gives you a location and you become a sojourner. What's the location? The ultimate location is heaven. But on the way to heaven, we can be much better citizens of earth to influence and change and challenge the people around us, our family, our friends, our enemies, whoever you want to put in there. So the origins, you know what it's relating to? It is relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, observable universe. Have a think about that. It's beyond the visible, observable universe. And the most powerful telescopes in the world can't even get across our, our what do you call it, the galaxy. Our, what's our galaxy? The Milky Way? Are we the Milky Way? Any scientists here? They can't even, it can't even stretch across. The closest star to us is four and a half light years away, which takes millions of years to get there at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. So in the beginning, it's relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, observable universe, especially of relating to God. Who knows that the dictionary called the Merriam-Webster's? Who knows the Merriam-Webster's dictionary? It's the best dictionary you can get because if you get the original Merriam-Webster's dictionary, you will find in there the scriptures that go with the meaning. But over the years, they've culled out the scriptures. If you get an old original Webster's, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it'll give you scriptures. It's unbelievable. And over the years, the woke people have tried to cull it out and uh, they're even trying to stop it from being on the internet. They'll give you every other version. So the Word of God is supernatural in origin, one. The next one is eternal in duration, having infinite duration, everlasting, eternal, relating to eternity, characterized by the abiding fellowship with God. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says this, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, ran up to him, didn't mosey on up to him, ran up to him, and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit life? Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Verse 19, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he goes, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
one thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He didn't leave this guy hanging. He says, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the young man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Eternal duration. The eternal duration that he was looking for was not in his psyche. See, he wanted that, but he was planted in the world. As we get away from the fact that when we're planted in the world, it's a completely different kingdom to the kingdom of God. Because it's supernatural in origin, it's eternal in duration, and because it's eternal in duration, we have to realize and understand, and again, I has, it has taken me many, many years to catch up with what the Lord did for me 50 years ago. And that's how fast the Lord moves. The Lord moves at light speed, faster than light speed. It's faster than thought. And so when Jesus looked at him, you know, Jesus loved him. Why did he love him? He loved him because he'd done all these good things. But the Lord was looking for something more. He was actually looking for some part of this man's life that he could expose, and not only expose, but bring the weaknesses of that human life into the glaring, loving light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once that light shone on who he was talking to and then what he had to give up for who he was talking to, things changed in his mind. Well, I've done all that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, tick, 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 tick. This guy just about had the T-shirt. But when he was challenged on that one thing, he failed. He did not see the eternal duration that was opened up. Jesus said, go sell, give it all to the poor, and come follow me. If he would have did that, his whole life would have had a completely different trajectory, but it was, he didn't. He left, and he went away sad. So it's eternal in duration. That means if it's eternal in duration... The word of God lasts forever. Before the earth, after the earth, after the whole entire universe, the cosmos is wiped out, melted away. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing called um, anthrop, anthrop, anthropity. Oh, I read sometimes, I read too much. And it talks about the cooling down of the universe and the deterioration of the universe. It's deteriorate. Entropy. I was close. I was close. Entropy. And there's three laws of entropy, and they're all not good. But I like the law of the Lord. The Word of God is supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in valor. It is not capable of being expressed, inexpressible in valor. It's indescribable. It has joy. It has strength of mind and spirit and enables people to encounter things that they can overcome. Inexpressible in valor. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and a self-discipline. Uh, dis some, some other virgins will say that the Spirit of God gives us power, love, and a sound mind. And a sound mind. And I remember praying for somebody uh, that I loved dearly. And she'd gone through a whole range of family stuff. And she knew the Lord. She was powerful in the Lord. But she just had such a, a, a terrible intense um, incident happened. She lost her balance. And I remember going and praying with her and praying this very scripture over her. Laid my hands on her and prayed, Father, the Spirit of God does not, does not give us that thing of timidity, but gives us power, love, and a sound mind. And you know what happened? Within minutes, she came out of it within minutes. And it wasn't the prayer that I prayed, it was the word that spoke it over her. And that's what's so powerful about the word of God, inexpressible in valor. 
The next point I want to talk about is it's infinite in scope. It means it's extending in, indefinitely. It's infinite in space, immeasurable, or inconceivably great or extensive. And you know, if, we, if you actually read, read the word, you can pick the Bible up and the very first page can baffle you. And the very first page in the Bible says simply this, in the beginning, origin. That just trips over a whole lot of people that don't believe in God, in the beginning. And the very next word is God, which is usually their contention, anything to do with God. It's infinite in scope. It extends beyond the barriers of what we see as normal. It does not have a finite value. It's infinite. It is able to change you and I by the mere power of its infinity. And I love the thought of, well, I'm a finite being. You're an infinite being. Therefore, you can infuse me with infinity. I like that. I'll be infinite, man. But on a serious note, if we connect up with the infinite God, church, just remember this. We have this awesome God who knows everything. And as we read through this and as we get through the points, you'll see what I'm talking about. Infinite in scope. It's intention, it's object. You know, last night, it was really funny. Um, I saw this car coming around... Um, Shipwreck Bay, and it was about 10 o'clock last night. And you couldn't see whether the tide was in or out. And I thought to myself, I'll get my UB telescope thingy and 80 power, whatever it is. And so I, I got him on there, and I was looking, and I could see that his headlights were lighting up the road, and there was no, the tide wasn't in because I thought, oh, he might be out there, and the tide's, the tide's going to swamp him. And I thought I might have to dial the police. So anyway, he, he was fine. But then I thought, oh, look at the moon. So I got my telescope and I looked up and it's the first time I've ever seen through a telescope and I could see the um, craters. I thought that was fantastic. And I said to, said to Rowan, I said, hey, honey, come and have a look at this. And you could actually see the craters and you could see the dark side of the moon because it was just shadowed there. But you could see clearly, first time I'd ever with my naked eye, seen that. I've seen it on TV, I've seen it in documentaries, but this is the first time that I physically was looking at the moon, could see the size of the craters. I thought, wow. My scope is an infinite in scope. It's just the scope. The infinite scope that the Bible has goes beyond anything that we can comprehend. And if you read in Isaiah 48, 12, it says this, this is the infinite in scope. It says, listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called, I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summoned them, I love this, they all stand up together. It's like, yes, sir. That's the power of our God. What an exciting God we serve. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first. I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. And when I summon them, they stand up to, to attention because I am the Lord God. It is infinite in scope. The word of God is infinite in scope. The next thing I want to look at is regenerative in power. Hebrews 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and the spirit, its joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts ooh, and the attitudes ooh, of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him 
to whom we must give account. I had a friend that got saved through mathematics. In fact, he came to my induction a few weeks ago and he sat over there in that corner right where the key lady is, Judy Fezza. And he sat right over there and he got saved through mathematics. He was a mathematician and he got saved. And the biggest thing that he had to struggle with was simply this. When it came to it, it was the word of God being alive. He didn't mind that. It was sharper than any double-edged sword. He didn't mind that. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. He didn't mind that. The joints and the marrows, he didn't mind that. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. He did mind that. Why? Because to him it was an intrusion of his privacy. Can't you leave my thoughts in my mind? And the Lord goes, no. Because your mind is connected to your heart. If your heart is evil, if your heart is dirty, you will think dirty things. If your heart is full of clean things, it will think of clean things. So if the word of God is read by you and you pray about things, you will have a clean heart and a spirit that is willing to be open to the Lord for him to do his work through you. So my friend got to that part where it says, hmm, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. No, problem. Verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Problem. And his problem was starting to mount up. It's because he didn't want to be accountable. As Christians, we have got to be accountable. Amen? If I get together with these pastors and we start to pray and the community starts to see that there is unity within the churches in the leadership of the churches, and we start to pray, we have to submit to each other. We have to start to submit doctrine. We have to start to submit theology. And we have to start to submit our own pride, getting out of the road and letting God be God and who he is and who he wants to be in our hearts. So my friend, when he got to that part, he says, nothing at all is hidden from God's side. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him. And we must give account. Are you kidding me? And he reacted quite negatively. So he had a time, I think it was about 1 o'clock in the morning to about 6 o'clock in the morning, where he wrestled with the scripture. He wrestled. And what was he wrestling with? He was wrestling with the regenerative power that God could give him through the word. Forget about the mathematics. Because all of a sudden he'd been confronted with the facts that God is God and he was not. Because he was basically an, an, an atheist. And when he came to the Lord and he gave that up, he said it took till 6 o'clock in the morning. He said, I literally wrestled. I felt like Jacob. And he said, I wrestled and I wrestled. And I finally said at 6 o'clock in the morning, I said, okay, I'll give up. He said, immediately the dark went and the light came into the room. He said, something lifted off my shoulders. He said, I don't know what it was. He does know what it is now because he's 50 odd years down the track in the Lord, still loving the Lord. He knew what it was later on because he grew up. He took that unprecedented step of praying and reading, even though he didn't want to believe what was written in front of him, he still did that same thing. He still did it. He prayed and he read and he grew up. The next point that we're talking about is infallibility and authority. Now this is a scary one because authority when it's shown cannot be kicked to the side. Exodus chapter 20 verse 18 and 19 when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled, trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, verse 19, speak to us yourself. We and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. That's authority. When the Lord came down on Sinai, they saw his presence. They heard his voice. 
and it freaked them out, the whole nation. They, they didn't hear Moses speak to them. They heard the audible voice of God. It wasn't mass hypnosis. It was God descending to make a statement that would impact the planet from then till now. Infallible in authority? Absolutely. You cannot question that type of authority. When the Lord showed up on Mount Sinai and the Israelites saw it, there was no question. The only thing that they asked was, please, Moses, you talk to us. Don't let God talk to us. That's authority. That's power. And we have that same authority. We might not have the biggest voice, but if you take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody, you are taking that same authority to the people that you are speaking to, be their fa be they family or friends. You see, the amazing part about all of this is that God has an interest in all of our lives. Not only has he got an interest in all of our lives, he's got an interest in all of your family's life. The generational people after you, your friends, he's interested in them. And if you don't read what the word is saying and you don't pray what the word is saying, you are not getting the message out to your friends and family. And if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? Because the word of God challenges me every day to read his word, to pray and seek his face, to ask him, what do you need or what do you want me to do, Lord? What's next, Father? Teach me, Lord. I am teachable. Thank you, Lord God. So the infallible authority, when Jesus, when God turned up and Jesus was there. This is not modalism. I don't believe in modalism. If you don't know what a modalism is, you go and get a dictionary and you go and plug it into two. That's another subject. When Jesus turned up there and spoke, and the Father spoke, that would have been terrifying. And it's reflected in what the word says. Uh, don't have God speak to us or we will die. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Universal in interest. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. What a statement. Universal in interest. Is he interested in, the, in planet Earth? You bet. Verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. What a comforting thought. He's not far from any of us. He's just one word, God, away from our hearts. Lord. He's a silent listener. Verse 28. For in him... We live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. Has he got a universal interest in planet Earth? You bet. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives... Everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. We have a great huge problem in planet earth right now. In the Middle East, the boundaries were marked out. People have come along and blurred the boundaries. Blurred it. The boundaries that was given to Israel is now shrunk. They've only got about, if I remember correctly looking at it, they only hold about 50% of the boundaries that was given to them when Abraham was around. They've been reduced by the Western world 
and the political stuff that's gone down since 1948. It's been reduced and reduced and reduced. So those boundaries have been blurred. When you blur the boundaries, you have problems. And guess what we've got right now? We have a massive problem in the Middle East. We've got the Palestinians who are claiming that they were there before the Jews. There's no such thing. If you go back through history, you won't find anything about history about the Palestinian people. You can't find any artefacts. You won't find any coins. There's no kingdoms. There's no policies. There's no interaction between international um, countries. There's no transpiring of business. There's nothing. And so what has been fed to the world has been just a whole lot of lies. And the world is sucking it up. Why are they sucking it up? Pretty simply because of this. Because the day and age that we're living in now, black is white, white is black, up is down, left is right, right is left, wrong is now right, and right is now wrong. Righteousness has been lost in the street. And we don't understand, if you don't understand, if I don't understand, we should be the most informed people on the planet with what I've just read out to you this morning. The Word of God is supernatural in origin. It's eternal in duration. It's inexpressible in valor. Unbelievable. Its scope is huge. Regenerative in power. Those things count massively. Infallible in authority, universal in interest. And so we have this ongoing war in the Middle East, which is just escalating. If you think it's going away, it's not going to go away that quick. The hate from the Persian Empire, the prince of Persia is not dead. Can I just say this to you, church? The prince of Persia is well and truly alive. All you have to do is turn your TV on, which I do not watch mainstream media TV. Turn it on and you will see the lies that have been perpetrated. When you read the Word of God, it's in conflict with the Word of God. I take my truth from the Word of God and the Father of all truth and I disbelieve the Father of lies. So in verse 27, Acts 17, 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we, I love this thought, for in him we live and we move and we have our existence. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Personal application. The word of God is personal in application. John 3:16. Who knows, who can quote off the top of your head, John 3.16? Somebody stand up and quote it. Just quote it loud. Anybody? Amen. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave. Personal and application. Yes, the word of God is personal and application. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you had a son that you absolutely adored, whom Abraham had, because Abraham had Isaac in his late life, he had many others, and we know the consequences of all that, and he was going to sacrifice because he believed that God would raise him from the dead anyway. And when you look at that picture, I am still blown away when I found this out years and years and years ago, that on that same mountain, God was looking forward to when Jesus was going to be crucified on that mountain. The forward thinking of God before he calls out the beginning or the end from the beginning. I, I struggle in my mere mortal mind to understand the things of God. I don't struggle when I switch, switch the key on called faith. 
then it opens up a whole new meaning. Personal and application, you bet. The Word of God is personal and application. And it is inspired in totality. Who agrees with that? It is inspired in totality. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It doesn't say bad work. It says good work. So when a man or a woman comes from the world, they have to change their way of thinking because some people think down a, a track that is just far too left field for me. And they think down, down those tracks and you can see when they run into, they go bang into the cross and they go boom, fall back on the ground and they go, what the heck was that? Oh, that was just the truth. You've run into the truth. You've been telling lies for a long time. Now you've just run into the truth. And the truth will set you free. Not your truth, the truth. Because everybody's got a truth. But it's about the truth of who God is. So all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The concept of microcosm and macrocosm in cosmology kind of tantalates my taste buds. Because when you get two, you microcosm, micro, macro. Macro, generally, when you speak in the universe, means the universe. Micro means part of the universe. Well, I like the concept of micro being in opposition to macro. And this is what I like. I like that this God who is so far above both of those things is able to come down and be in the macro and the micro. Have a think about that. If he can transcend both camps of thinking or both philosophies, because they are philosophies today, if he can transcend both those things, then what else can he do? Nothing is actually impossible for him. So supernatural in origin. Because the Bible is of a supernatural origin, it is not something that we can twist to fit whatever words or methods we please. Sorry, can't change the word of God. Understanding the supernatural character of the scripture is vital in understanding how God treats, deals, and saves sinners such as myself. And he saved me over 50 years ago. And I have had to learn some hard, tough lessons. Are you excluded from that group? If you haven't had a hard lesson or a hard, tough decision or a hard thing to face up to, then it'll come. In time, it'll come. So the Word of God being supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible, in valor, infinite in scope, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, and personal in application, and inspired in totality. I love the inspiration that the Word of God gives me. Sometimes I've woken up in the morning, you know, I, I don't know what, I, dep- I have no idea what depression is. Maybe I have been depressed, but I don't know. Um, but I certainly haven't reflected a lot of people's when they're going through depression. But I've often felt sad about certain members of my family. And you know, when I sit down and I start to read the word, the word just lifts me up. It does. Just give, give myself 15, 20 minutes reading the word, and just meditating on the word. Gone. Because it's inspired in totality. Its origins are supernatural. Let's stand this morning, church. I've gone over time. I'm sorry. But let's just stand. I'd like um, Paul and Roseanne to come forward. Church, I want us to... Is Cliffy here? 
Okay. I would like this couple to come forward. We all have our trials and we all have our tribulations. And church, as we pray for them, I asked Paul if I could share this. He's been given 12 months to live. He, 6, 60, 12. I thought 12 was a little bit more better. <laughs> 6 to 12 months. So they have a trial they're heading forward to. And what we need to do, church, is we need to reach out to them and pray for them as a church. And please, can you put them on your prayer list every morning, even if it's only a couple of minutes, to say, Lord, remember Paul, Roseanne, Eagerpoft, in Jesus' name. These are serious times that we're living in, folks. The whole world out there is going crazy and we have trials and tribulations inside the church. If anybody from the worship team, Shah, if you guys want to come up, you can come and lay hands on them. Angela, come and lay hands on them. Mike. Pam. Thank you, Father. 